sailed over the raging foam, he's wooed a wife and he's brought her round. He wooed her for her long golden hair, his mother wrought at a mighty care. And a weary spell she's laid on her. She'd be with child full long and many's the year, but a child she would never bear. And in her flower she lies in pain. King Willie and a bed head he do stand as down his cheeks, the salt and tears do run. King Willie back to his mother he did run, and he's gone there as a begging son. There's me true love as this fine noble steed, the like of which you ne'er did see. At every part of this horse's mane, there's hanging fifty silver bells and ten. There's hanging fifty bells and ten. This goodly gift shall be your own. If back to me own true love you'll turn again, that she might bear a baby son. Of a child she'll never lie to be, nor from sickness will she ever be free. But she will die, and she will turn to clay, and you will wed with another man. And sighing says this weary man, as back to his own true love he's gone again. I wish my life was at an end. King Willie back to his mother he did run and he's gone there as a begging son. Says me true love as his fine golden girdle set with jewels all about the middle. But every part of this girdle's hem, there's hanging fifty silver bells and ten, there's hanging fifty bells and ten. This goodly gift shall be your own. If back to me own true love you'll turn again That she might bear her baby son Of a child she'll never lie to be Nor from sickness will she ever be free But she will die and she will turn to clay And you will wed with another May and Sighing says this weary man as back to his own true love he's gone again I wish my life was at an end But up and spoke his noble queen And she has told King Willie of a plan how she might bear a baby son. She says you must go get you down to the marketplace and you must buy you a loaf of wax and you must shape it as a babe that is to nurse and you must make two eyes of glass. Ask your mother to a christening day and you must stand there close as you can be that you might hear what she do say. King Willie, he's gone down to the marketplace and he has bought him a loaf of wax. And he has shaped it as a babe that is to nurse and he has made two eyes of glass. He asked his mother to a christening day and he has stood there close as he could be that he might hear what she did say. And how she stormed and how she swore she spied the babe where no babe could be before. She spied the babe where none could be before. Says who was it who undid the nine witch knots braided in amongst this lady's locks? And who was it who took out the combs of care braided in amongst this lady's hair? And who was it slew the master king? That ran and slept 
All beneath this lady's bed that ran and slept, all beneath the bed. And who was it unlaced her left shoe? And who was it that let her light to be that she might bear her baby boy? And it was Willie who undid the line which knots braided in amongst this lady's locks. And it was Willie who took out the cones of care braided in amongst this lady's hair. And it was Willie the master kicked its sleigh. And it was Willie who unlaced her left foot shoe, and he has lent the light to be. And she has born out a baby son, and great are the blessings that be them upon, and great are the blessings them upon. Thank <laughs> you. 
to set up a hobgoblin in my own corn patch and almost at my own doorstep, said Mother Rigby to herself, puffing out a whiff of smoke. I could do it if I pleased, but I'm tired of doing marvelous things, and so I'll keep within the bounds of everyday business just for variety's sake. Besides, there is no use in scaring the little children for a mile round about, though tis true I'm a witch. It was settled, therefore, in her own mind that the scarecrow should represent a fine gentleman of the period, so far as the materials at hand would allow. Perhaps it may be as well to enumerate the chief of the articles that went to the composition of this figure. The most important item of all, probably, although it made so little show, was a certain broomstick, on which Mother Rigby had taken many an airy gallop at midnight, and which now served the scarecrow by way of a spinal column, or, as the unlearned phrase it, a backbone. One of its arms was a disabled flail, which used to be wielded by Goodman Rigby, before his spouse worried him out of this troublesome world. The other, if I mistake not, was composed of the pudding stick and a broken rung of a chair tied loosely together at the elbow. As for its legs, the right was a hoe handle, and the left an undistinguished and miscellaneous stick from the woodpile. Its lungs, stomach, and other affairs of that kind were nothing better than a meal bag stuffed with straw. Thus we have made out the skeleton and entire corporosity of the scarecrow, with the exception of its head. And this was admirably supplied by a somewhat withered and shriveled pumpkin, in which Mother Rigby cut two holes for the eyes and a slit for the mouth, leaving a bluish-colored knob in the middle to pass for a nose. It was really quite a respectable face. I've seen worse ones on human shoulders at any rate, said Mother Rigby, and many a fine gentleman has a pumpkin head, as well as my scarecrow. But the clothes in this case were to be the making of the man. So the good old woman took down from a peg an ancient plum-colored coat of London make, and with relics of embroidery on its seams, cuffs, pocket flaps, and buttonholes, but lamentably worn and faded, patched at the elbows, tattered at the skirts, and threadbare all over. On the left breast was a round hole, whence either a star of nobility had been rent away, or else the hot heart of some former wearer had scorched it through and through. The neighbor said that this rich garment belonged to the black man's wardrobe, and that he kept it at Mother Rigby's cottage for the convenience of slipping it on whenever he wished to make a grand appearance at the governor's table. To match the coat there was a velvet waistcoat of very ample size, and formally embroidered with foliage that had been as brightly golden as the maple leaves in October, but which had now quite vanished out of the substance of the velvet. Next came a pair of scarlet breeches, once worn by the French governor of Louisbourg, and the knees of which had touched the lower step of the throne of Louis le Grand. The Frenchman had given these small clothes to an Indian powwow, who parted with them to the old witch for a gill of strong waters at one of their dances in the forest. Furthermore, Mother Rigby produced a pair of silk stockings and put them on the figure's legs, where they showed as unsubstantial as a dream, with the wooden reality of the two sticks making itself miserably apparent through the holes. Lastly, she put her dead husband's wig on the bare scalp of the pumpkin, and surmounted the hole with a dusty three-cornered hat, in which was stuck the longest tail feather of a rooster. Then the old dame stood the figure up in a corner of her cottage, and chuckled to behold its yellow semblance of a visage, with its knobby little nose thrust into the air. It had a strangely self-satisfied aspect, and seemed to say, Come, look at me. And you are well worth looking at, that's a fact, quoth Mother Rigby, in admiration at her own handiwork. I've made many a puppet since I've been a witch, but methinks this is the finest of them all. "'Tis almost too good for a scarecrow. "'And by the by, I'll just fill a fresh pipe of tobacco "'and then take him out to the corn-patch.' "'While filling her pipe, the old woman continued to gaze "'with almost motherly affection at the figure in the corner. "'To say the truth, whether it were chance or skill or downright witchcraft, "'there was something wonderfully human in this ridiculous shape, "'bedizened with its tattered finery. "'And as for the countenance, it appeared to shrivel its yellow surface into a grin, a funny kind of expression, betwixt scorn and merriment, as if it understood itself to be a jest at mankind. The more Mother Rigby looked, the better she was pleased. Dickon, cried she sharply, another coal for my pipe. 
Hardly had she spoken than, just as before, there was a red glowing coal on the top of the tobacco. She drew in a long whiff and puffed it forth again into the bar of morning sunshine, which struggled through the one dusty pane of her cottage window. Mother Rigby always liked to flavor her pipe with a coal of fire from the particular chimney corner whence this had been brought. But where that chimney corner might be, or who brought the coal from it, further than that the invisible messenger seemed to respond to the name of Dickon, I cannot tell. That puppet yonder, thought Mother Rigby, still with her eyes fixed on the scarecrow, is too good a piece of work to stand all summer in a corn patch, frightening away the crows and blackbirds. He's capable of better things. Why, I've danced with a worse one, when partners happen to be scarce, at our witch meetings in the forest. What if I should let him take his chance among the other men of straw and empty fellows who go bustling about the world? The old witch took three or four more whiffs of her pipe and smiled. He'll meet plenty of his brethren at every street corner, continued she. Well, I didn't mean to dabble in witchcraft today, further than the lighting of my pipe. But a witch I am, and a witch I'm likely to be, and there's no use trying to shirk it. I'll make a man of my scarecrow, were it only for the joke's sake. While muttering these words, Mother Rigby took the pipe from her own mouth and thrust it into the crevice which represented the same feature in the pumpkin visage of the scarecrow. Puff, darling, puff, said she. Puff away, my fine fellow. Your life depends on it. This was a strange exhortation, undoubtedly, to be addressed to a mere thing of sticks, straw, and old clothes, with nothing better than a shriveled pumpkin for a head, as we know to have been the scarecrow's case. Nevertheless, as we must carefully hold in remembrance, Mother Rigby was a witch of singular power and dexterity, and keeping this fact duly before our minds, we shall see nothing beyond credibility in the remarkable incidents of our story. Indeed. The great difficulty will be at once got over if we can only bring ourselves to believe that, as soon as the old dame bade him puff, there came a whiff of smoke from the scarecrow's mouth. It was the very feeblest of whiffs, to be sure, but it was followed by another and another, each more decided than the preceding one. Puff away, my pet, puff away, my pretty one, Mother Rigby kept repeating with her pleasantest smile. It is the breath of life to ye and that you may take my word for. Beyond all question, the pipe was bewitched. There must have been a spell either in the tobacco or in the fiercely glowing coal that so mysteriously burned on top of it, or in the pungently aromatic smoke which exhaled from the kindled weed. End of cassette number one, side one.
The Living Corpse. The Civil War was a bloody, bloody war. It pitted brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, and friend against friend. During the Civil War, there were many wagon loads of wounded soldiers. Many times they had to wait for the doctor or the medical supplies to catch up with them. And sometimes the next morning when they looked at those wounded soldiers, they found that some of the soldiers had died. It was thus that the local undertakers were very busy men. They had many people and many bodies to prepare for burying. And this particular busy day when the young soldiers' bodies were brought into the undertaker, he was so busy that he had them place the bodies in tubs of ice about the room. And it was not until the next morning that the actual embalming could begin. The first thing the undertaker would do was to get that body out and put it on his laboratory table. And then he would neatly stitch the mouth shut of the corpse. And after that, he would place a needle and tube into each extended arm. In the one arm, the tube would come out and drain the body's blood. But in the other arm was the needle and the pump that would put in the embalming fluid. The process had no sooner begun when the body set up. <coughs> the mouth was trying to work. The body was trying to speak. The tubes were yanked from the arms, but the body fell dead upon the laboratory table. The embalming fluid had reached the heart, and the body had died. After that, strange things began to happen in the laboratory. No matter how late the undertaker stayed or how early he came back, things would have happened while he was gone. Furniture would be rearranged. Bodies would be moved. Bodies would be missing. The needles and the thread would all be gone. The embalming fluid was spilled all over the floor, and the needles were bent and broken and thrown about the room. The undertaker could not continue doing his job. The ghost of that living corpse that he had killed haunted him, and finally he fled into his home and unto his childhood memories and into insanity. I will call this the affair of the SS Watertown. The crewman of the tanker reported a weird phenomenon after their two dead shipmates had been buried at sea. The memorial service was over. The boards were tilted across the rail of the SS Watertown, and the bodies of James Courtney and Michael Meehan were consigned to their watery grave. The two men had died of the effects of gas fumes and the burial at sea took place at latitude 14-20 north, longitude 50 west. The uh, ship continued on, bound for the Panama Canal. The tragic incident should not have been closed, and it was not. The bodies of the two crewmen had been buried on December 4, 1954, on January 9, 1955, one of the gasoline tanker's crew, a worried expression on his face, approached the captain. Begging your pardon, sir, he said, but we, the, uh, the crew, that is, don't like what's going on. And what might be that, demanded Captain Keith Tracy. Courtney and Meehan, sir, was the reply. They ain't dead. They're following the ship. The skipper looked suspiciously at the man. Then he said, You been drinking, sailor? So help me, sir, the seaman raised his hand solemnly. It ain't only me that's seen him. 
all the men has every evening at twilight. We see him swimming alongside about eight feet off the port rail. Captain Tracy laughed. But when the spokesman's shipmates confirmed the statement, he said, very well, let's all go have a look. Well, they went. They looked. And then the skipper asked for a camera. A camera was obtained. Pictures were taken of the spot, and both camera and film were locked in the ship's safe. After the vessel had passed through the Panama Canal and uh, put in at Colon, the film was taken to a photographer who knew nothing of the affair. When the film was developed, one of the negatives bore the faint image of two heads. To a man, the crew of the SS Watertown swore that the faces were those of their dead crewmates, Courtney and Meehan. The facts of this case were sworn to by Monroe Atkins, assistant engineer of the gasoline tanker, and by the skipper, Keith Tracy. They were checked and verified by the Burns Detective Agency. The photographs were pronounced genuine. They had not been tampered with. Those pictures are now owned by the Henry L. Doherty Company. What's the answer? Well, it's one of those things that baffle the finest scientific brains and which are more easily forgotten than explained.
перемена. Legend of Gwendolyn Rana by Frank Maltese. 
I had another dream about Gwen Rana last night. I dream about her often, especially after we've played a concert. Maybe that's all she ever was, a dream. Either that or who knows. It's a strange story. I've never told anyone until now. It was my third year at Chadwick State College. I was playing lead guitar in a band called The Five Fingers. A dumb name, I admit. Our music was better than our name. We were one of two bands playing at the homecoming dance that year. We were playing the first half of the dance. We'd be on until 11 o'clock when they'd stop the dancing to crown the homecoming queen and introduce the football team and do some other boring things. Then the other band would come on and we'd get to join the party or go home and sleep as we chose. While we were playing, I saw this girl standing down front. The first thing I noticed about her was that her clothes were about 15 years out of style. The next thing I noticed was how pretty she was. She wasn't dancing. She was just standing there watching us, watching me. So when our set was over, hi, my name's Ron, Ron Landers. I'm Gwen Rana, Gwendolyn really, but don't call me that. I really like your music. That was another point in her favor. She had great taste in rock and roll bands. We talked during the break. Do you go to school here? I can't remember seeing you before. No, I'm still in high school. I'm 17. I hope you don't think I'm a baby. My parents do. They don't like me to go to the college dances. Pretty soon the music started up again. You're a really fantastic dancer. Thank you. You're very good yourself. I love to dance. Do you know how to do the twist or the frug? No. Those are old dances, aren't they? From the 1960s? Yes. I guess no one remembers how to do them anymore. We dance together for the rest of the evening. It's almost 2 o'clock. Will you drive me home? Sure. We were driving around the bend of the road that was known as Breakneck Curve. Is something wrong? No. No, I'm cold. That's all. Sorry. The heater in this car doesn't work too well. Take my jacket. A few minutes later... Wait. Stop the car. You'd better let me off here. My parents... I'm supposed to be grounded. Are you sure it's safe? There's nothing around here but the cemetery. I don't have far to walk. It's been a lovely evening, Ron. Hey, when will I see you? Call me, 547-6443. Hey, my jacket. I drove home feeling very warm. Next day, she's not just some girl, Stewie. She's special. You must have seen her. She was standing right down in front all during our set. A girl in an old-fashioned white dress. A white dress? There wasn't anyone in a white dress. Arlen, did you see any such young lady? Negative. Ronnie, I believe you are imagining things. Ah, you guys are both blind. Hello? Hello, is this Mrs. Rana? May I speak to Gwen, please? What? Gwen? You want Gwendolyn? Who is this? Uh, my name's Ron. I met Gwen at, uh, at the library the other day. I loaned her my jacket and... Just a... just a minute, please. Uh-oh. I hope she's not in big trouble with her parents. Moments later. This is Howard, Rana. To whom am I speaking, please? Ron Landers, Mr. Rana. Listen, I hope I can explain. Mr. Landers, will you be at our home at 7 o'clock this evening? The address is... It was one of those voices it's hard to say no to. 
I had no idea what was going on. The address was miles away from where I had left Gwen the night before. Mr. Landers, you say that you met our daughter. Is this the girl you met? Yes. What's this all about? Mr. Landers, Gwendolyn died 14 years ago. She went to the college homecoming dance against our wishes. She met a boy there and left with him on his motorcycle. There was an accident at what the young people call breakneck curve. They were both killed instantly. But, but I met her. She, I... I can't explain, son. Her grave is in the cemetery. You can see it for yourself. I think I knew what I would find before I saw it. My jacket! Had I been dancing with a ghost? Had I gone a little bit crazy? Who was Gwen Rana? I suppose I'll never know. Become a werewolf. Ingredients, chalk or string. One iron vessel, one iron tripod. Any three of the following. Asafoetida, 
parsley, opium, henbane, saffron, aloe, poppy seed, or solanum. One freshly killed cat, anise seed, camphor, opium, one wolf skin girdle. Preparation. Go to a solitary place at midnight when the moon is new and strong, preferably a desert, the woods, or a mountaintop. On perfectly level ground, mark off with the chalk or string a circle with a radius of at least seven feet, and inside this, a circle with a radius of three feet. In the center, boil water in an iron vessel on the iron tripod. As the water boils, throw in handfuls of the three spices, meanwhile intoning. Spirits from the deep who never sleep, be kind to me. Spirits from the grave without a soul to save, be kind to me. Spirits of the trees that grow upon the leaves, be kind to me. Spirits of the air, foul and black, not fair, be kind to me. Water spirits hateful to ships and bathers fateful, be kind to me. Spirits of earthbound dead that glide with noiseless tread, be kind to me. Spirits of heat and fire destructive in your ire, be kind to me. Spirits of cold and ice, patrons of crime and vice, be kind to me. Wolves, vampires, satyrs, ghosts, elect of all the devilish hosts, I pray you send hither, send hither, send hither the great grey shape that makes men shiver, shiver, shiver. Come, come, come. Removing your upper garment, smear your body with the fat of the freshly killed cat, mixed with aniseed, camphor, and opium. Bind your loins with the wolf's skin and kneel down within the middle of the smaller circle to await the unknown. The unknown will appear, or make its presence felt, when the fire burns blue and quickly dies out. Hello, welcome to Answer with Comedy. It's Halloween. 30 seconds or more of Halloween answering machine messages. Here's how to use your Answer for Comedy tape. Insert the tape into a standard cassette player. Listen to the tape and choose a message you want to record. You will hear a three second cueing tone before each message starts. Find a quiet place, record the message from the cassette player speaker into the answering machine's microphone. Make sure the cassette player speaker is three to four inches from the answering machine's microphone. Now listen and enjoy Answer with Comedy. Hello, we're out. But you just embarged upon a capsule of eerie things of Halloween. Fasten your chain. Our first stop is the torture chamber. <laughs> Look, there's still a few visitors at the torture chamber. They still have their heads screwed on right. Can't say much for the rest of their... Oh, well, would you like to join them? Let's see if the wolfman is in. Or is he grossly furred out? I'm sure he would love to massage your neck. You have a beautiful neck. Look, there's Dracula flying past the window. He would love to check your blood pressure. He loves old positive. But if you'd like to get a hold of us, leave an eerie message and that deadly phone number, and we'll get back to you after I get off the stretch rack. <coughs> Wait for the sound of a bee. Hello, we're out, but it's Halloween. Halloween, Halloween, oh, what strange things are seen. 
witches' packs, broomstick riders, mice and rats. Halloween, be careful, for among the strange creatures in the night, the devil is alert, stalking the innocent, trying to change those souls that aren't casting a shadow upon the ground. And the tortures of hell is just around the corner. You can hear the agonizing screams of the unknown that lingeringly awaits. Be extremely careful, for it is an easy slide into hell. Leave a short message and your phone number, and we'll get back to you before the black cat crosses your path. Wait for the sound of the beat. Hello, I'm out. I feel a change coming on because the moon is full and it's my night out. Strange as it seems, I don't feel like walking in an upright position. My appetite yearns for the taste of fresh meat. So fresh, it could become a disaster. If you're out tonight, stay on the well-lighted paths. You never know what's in the night shadows. If you should run into me tonight, don't be disappointed if I don't offer you my paw. Leave a short message and your phone number. And remember, the darkness will not hurt you. It's the unknown things in the night that can harm you. Wait for the sound of the bee. Hello, I'm out moonlighting. I do part-time surgery. I took a correspondence course written by Dr. Frankenstein. I had to do all his studies in reverse. All of Dr. Frankenstein's patients were dead before he made them alive. All of my patients were alive until, no, that's not coming out right. No wonder I've got so many unpaid bills from my patients. Leave a short message and your phone number and I'll get back to you when the moon is full and the clock strikes midnight. Would you like to have some surgery? Wait for the sound of the bee. Yes, we will, we're here to save you. Tell us. How can I feel? I can hear you, yes. Oh, you. Tell us what happened. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened. Fire. Yeah. The plane caught fire. And it crashed. Yes. 
Where, where did it crash? Do you remember? Here? Near. Near here. The church? Near the church? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, all right, it's not that. Dusty Miller. Can we... Dusty Miller. Dusty Miller. Dusty Miller. Pat Sullivan. Yes. Jerry Arnold. Jerry Arnold. Jerry Arnold. Jerry Arnold. Well, you know, you know, can you hear me? You know you've left the earth behind. In the plane you died. Do you remember that? Yes. But look up. Don't be afraid. Let go of the earth. Let go of the earth, you understand? You don't belong here. Yes, look up, ask for help, upwards, and go towards the light. But you're holding yourself down. Tell that to Jerry, to Dusty, and to Pat Sullivan. Sir Margaret ran in the merry green wood and pulled a flower but one. When at her side stood young Tamlin, Saint Margaret, leave it alone. How dare you pull my flowers, madam? How dare you break my tree? How dare you run in these green woods without the leave of me? Oh, this green wood, it is my own. My father gave it me. And I can pluck myself a flower without the leave of thee. He took her by the milk white hand and by the grass green sleeve and laid her low down on the flowers and asked of her no leave. And when he'd had his will of her, young Margaret, she felt shame. Says if you are a gentleman, Pray tell to me your name. Oh, Tamlin is the name, he said, the elf queen gave to me. And long I haunted these green woods, all for your fair body. So do not pluck that herb, Margaret, that herb that grows so grey. Oh, that would kill the little babe that we've got in our play. When I was a boy, just turned of nine, my uncle sent for me to hunt and hawk and ride with him and keep him company. Oh, drowsy, drowsy as I was, dead sleep upon me fell, and the queen of Elfin she rode by and took me for herself. Tonight it is good Halloween, the elfin court will ride, and they that would their true love win, at the crossroads they must hide. The second court that comes along is clad in robes of green, it is the head court of them all. For in it rides the queen, and I upon a milk-white steed, with a gold star in my crown. And I do ride beside the queen, and you must pull me down. Then I will grow in your two arms, like a savage creature wild. But hold me fast, let me not go, I'm the father of your child. She took her petticoats in her hands, a mantle on her arm, and to the crossroads she's away, as fast as she could run. The first court it came riding by, she heard the bridles ring, and the second court all dressed in green, and tumbling like a king. She pulled him from his milk-white steed, he on the ground did lay, and the elf queen gave a shrieking cry. Young Tamalins away, me boys, young Tamalins away, 
and then they turned him in her arms to a wolf and to another. She held him fast in every shape to be a baby's father. They shaped him in her arms at last. A mother naked man. She wrapped him in a mantle green and saw a dream and saw a true love one. Out then cried the elfin queen, and an angry woman was she. Said you've stolen away the fairest knight in all my company. Oh, had I known Tamalin, she says, what now this night I see. I would have burned out your two grey eyes, and put in two from a tree, Tamalin. And put into from a tree. A Halloween mirror is made by the rays of the moon shining into a looking glass. If a girl goes secretly into a room at midnight between October and November, sits down at the mirror, and cuts an apple into nine slices, holding each on the point of a knife before she eats it, she may see in the moonlit glass the image of her lover looking over her left shoulder and asking for the last piece of apple. The wedding of the sark sleeve in the south running burn where the three lards lands met, and carrying it home to dry before the for us all to go on a ghost hunt and to get to where we're going let's walk with our hands slapping our legs and if you have to jump jump real high with your hands way up in the air that's good and if you hear anything kind of put your hand up to your ear and listen real careful and I'll say the words and you can do the actions with me once upon a Halloween night there was a brave little girl. And she said to all of her friends, I'm going out to find me a ghost. So she started out walking. She creaked open the gate. And she slammed it shut. And she kept on walking. But she hadn't walked far till she heard a cat. But no ghost, so she kept on walking. Soon she came to a bridge and she walked across it. And she kept on walking. But she hadn't walked far till she heard an owl. Still no ghost, so she kept on walking. Soon she came to a ditch. She couldn't step across it, so she said, I'll just jump it. So she backed up, and she started to run faster and faster, and she jumped the ditch, and she kept on walking. Soon she came to a swamp, so she jumped in, and she waded across. 
She jumped out and she kept on walking. Right through some mud. Out of that mud. And she started up Graveyard Hill. <gasps> there it was, a big old scary ghost. Oh, she ran down that hill. She ran through the mud. Out of that mud, she jumped into the swamp and she waded across it. She jumped out and she ran on. She jumped across the ditch and she ran on. She heard an owl, ooh, but she ran on. She ran across that bridge and she ran on. She heard a cat, meow, but she ran on. She ran through the gate, ugh, slammed it shut, and she said, oh, I just saw the ghost. And all of her Halloween friends said, boo. And that's the story of the ghost hunt. Thank you. Behind the city hall in Washington Park, on a pedestal facing the meeting street gate, resides the statue of William Pitt. Legend passed on by the street vendors of Charleston has it that on dark storm in night, the statue descends from its emplacement and stalks the streets of Lower Charleston, searching for its lost limbs. Indeed, this likeness of the former 18th century Prime Minister of England does appear to be absent from its normal habitat. But let us review the record before a decision is reached. History tells us that this is the statue that was the first statue made for America and imported to the colonies in 1766. It commemorated South Carolina's fondness for the outspoken Prime Minister of England who commiserated with the colony's plight prior to the revolution. Originally, this statue occupied a site at the center of meeting in Broad Street. Even in the late 1700s, traffic was a problem at this intersection. 
The English even had the cheek to damage their late Prime Minister's likeness by shelling it with cannon fire during the revolution and breaking off its arms. As traffic increased and problems grew, the statue was moved to the location now enjoyed by the Calhoun Street Sears and Roebuck building. Of course, in those days, it was an orphanage. And the orphans, not knowing anyone other than George Washington being important enough to erect a statue to, and having never heard of the classic dress of a Roman toga, called Pitt Washington in a nightgown. Insulted and armless, the statue was later returned to the present location in Washington Park. On stormy nights, does, as the street vendors whisper, Pitt roam the streets of Charleston, searching for his arms? Or is it merely the waving of oak limbs, producing an optical illusion, tricking the uneducated eye? Hello, Kate. Tom Connors was on his way to a dance in the next village. It was a long walk through fields and woods, but it was a soft, sweet evening, and he loved dancing, so Tom didn't mind. He'd gone only a short distance when he noticed a young woman following him. Maybe she's going to the dance, he thought, and he stopped and waited for her. As the woman got closer, he saw that it was Kate Faraday. They had danced together many times. He was about to call, Hello, Kate, when suddenly he remembered that Kate was dead. She had died last year, yet there she was, all dressed up for the dance. Tom wanted to run, but somehow it didn't seem right to run from Kate. He turned and started to walk away as fast as he could, but Kate followed him. He took a shortcut across a field, but still she followed. When he got to the dance hall, she was right behind him. There were a lot of people standing outside, and Tom tried to lose Kate in the crowd. He worked his way to the side of the building, then squeezed up against the wall behind some people, but Kate followed. She came so close she brushed up against him. Then she stopped and waited. He wanted to say, hello, Kate, just the way he did when she was alive. But he was so frightened he couldn't speak. Her eyes looked into his eyes, and she vanished.
Cobalt, Elf and Sprite, all are on their rounds tonight. In the one moon silver ray thrives their helter-skelter play. Fond of cellar, bar or stack, true unto the almanac, they present to credulous eyes strange hobgoblin mysteries. Cabbage stumps, straws wet with dew, apple skins and chestnuts too. And a mirror for some lass show what wonders come to pass. Doors they move, and gates they hide. Mischiefs that on moonbeams ride are their deeds, and by their spells love records its oracles. Don't we all, of long ago, by the ruddy fireplace glow, in the kitchen and the hall, those queer coof-like pranks recall? Eerie shadows were they then, but tonight they come again. Were we once more but sixteen? 
precious would be Halloween. Tenant by Francis Angevine Gray. Something lives in this house, unseen by my eyes. Impossible ever to take by surprise. On the staircase, a tread as I lie on my bed, a fleet footfall crosses the floor overhead. When I read in my chair, the sensitive air grows suddenly chill. I glance in the mirror in startled surmise. Some image dissolving baffles my eyes. A presence not evil, portending no harm, yet alien to all things familiar and warm. The Bat. By day, the bat is cousin to the mouse. He likes the attic of an aging house. His fingers make a hat about his head. His pulse beat is so slow, we think him dead. He loops in crazy figures half the night among the trees that face the corner light. But when he brushes up against a screen, we are afraid of what our eyes have seen. For something is amiss or out of place, when mice with wings can wear a human face. Halloween in a suburb. 
The steeples are white in the wild moonlight, and the trees have a silver glare. Past the chimneys high, see the vampires fly, and the harpies of upper air that flutter and laugh and stare. For the village dead to the moon outspread never shone in the sunset's gleam, but grew out of the deep that the dead years keep where the rivers of madness stream down the gulfs to a pit of dream. The chill wind blows through the rows of sheaves in the meadows that shimmer pale and comes to twine where the headstones shine and the ghouls of the churchyard wail for harvests that fly and fail. Not a breath of the strange gray gods of change that tore from the past its own can quicken this hour when a spectral power spreads sleep o'er the cosmic throne and looses the vast unknown. So here again stretch the veil and plain that moons long forgotten saw, and the dead leap gay in the pallid ray sprung out of the tomb's black maw to shake all the world with awe. And all that the morn shall greet forlorn, the ugliness and the pest of rows where thick rise the stones and brick, shall some day be with the rest, and brood with the shades unblessed. Then wild in the dark, let the lemurs bark, and the leprous spires ascend, for new and old alike in the fold of horror and death are penned, for the hounds of time to rend. If the moon shines on the black pines and an owl flies and a ghost cries and the hairs rise on the back, on the back, on the back of your neck. If you look quick at the moon slick on the black air and what goes there rides a broomstick 
And if things and pick, pick at the back, at, at the, the back, back, at the back, back of your neck, neck would you, you know then by the small men with the lit grins and with no chins, by the owl's whoo and the ghost boo, by the tomcat and the black bat on the night air, and the thing there by the thing, by the thing, by the dark thing there. Yes, you do, yes, you do know the thing I mean, that it's now, that it's now, that it's... Halloween! If, if the, the moon, moon shines, shines on the black... It was a long time ago, back in the late 1800s. There was a family of four, mother and a father, son and a daughter. They lived in the western part of the county, back in the foothills. The daughter was beautiful. She was 17 years old. Her hair was long and willowy, and it looked like sunlight on ripened grain. Her cheeks always had a red flush to them, but she used nothing for color, except every now and then when she'd go to a square dance, she might pinch her cheeks just a little. One May morning, the young girl took ill. Her cheeks lost their rosy color, and her skin, which used to be as, as white, as the underside of a dove, it lost its glow, and her skin turned gray. The mother worked with the girl. She gathered herbs, boiled it into tea, and she gave it to her young daughter. But the girl seemed to get sicker. Her health was failing her, and by the morning sun, the girl was gone. Her spirit left her silently. Her mother was asleep in the early hours, and when she awoke, she saw the girl lying still on the bed. The mother rubbed her eyes to chase away the sleep, and she tried to see breathing, but there was none. The bed was quiet. The mother went over and she touched her daughter, and she felt a chill, cold, gray, damp feeling from the child as quiet as the mood in the room. The mother walked over to the window, and she looked out. She stood there several minutes, watching the fog spin off in patterns. Then the tears came, and she could see nothing. Later, the father and the son took Maddox and shovels to the family graveyard, and they spent most of the day digging the grave. When they came back to the house, the mother was standing on the porch and her eyes were pained with the tears of the day full of weeping. We should use the old cedar box, she said, and she went back into the house. The father and the son climbed the loft of the barn and they saw the cedar wood box. It was long and narrow. The father opened it. It was lined with cotton calico, lined completely underneath the lid, the sides, and in the bottom there was a feather tick and a feather pillow. The father stood on top of the loft and he lowered the box and the son steadied it. And then they carried it together. When they got to the house, the mother said, she's ready. And the girl lay still on the bed. She was dressed in a white gown. I put my wedding dress on her, said the mother. She's just the same size as I was then. The father and the son took the box to the family site, and they buried her. The father threw the last bit of dirt on the fresh mound, and then they returned to the house. The son was exhausted, and he went upstairs, and he fell asleep. Then he was awakened by a scream, and, and he didn't know where it came from, and he looked about his room, and he looked out of the window, but there was no moon, so he could see nothing. And then he thought of his sister. And then he heard another scream. It was fuller and louder and, and shattering, and he 
realized it was coming from downstairs, so he quickly dressed. And when he got down the stairs, he saw his father standing beside his mother. He had her hand in his, and he was comforting her and trying to get her to lay back down. The mother screamed again, and the boy felt chills shudder throughout his body. I know she's alive. I know she's alive. You must go get her. I hear her calling me. It's okay, mother. It's okay. The father looked at the son, and his eyes were filled with fright. Go get the whiskey, his father whispered, and the son went into the kitchen. The mother screamed again. You must go dig her up. She's alive. I hear her calling. It's okay. She would not touch the whiskey. And the father and the son stayed with her through the long night. And when the day came, she was still screaming, begging, and pleading. Please, please, please go get her. The father turned to the son and he said, we must do it. We have got to show her or she will never get better. The three of them slipped away into the morning. The father and the son dug the grave and the mother stood above them weeping and watching. The wind swept through her long gray hair and made shadows on the earth. Finally, the shovel touched the box. They worked ropes under it and pulled it up. And the father took the end of the shovel and he began to pry the lid. The very nails he had nailed down just the day before squeaked and then they strained, but he worked the coffin lid loose. The father looked at the mother and then he slowly lifted the lid of the coffin. The father dropped the shovel and he stepped back. The mother shook her head and the tears came heavier and the son fell to his knees in the dirt. She lay quiet. Her dress was torn at the neck and her face, no longer beautiful, was contorted and twisted with past pain. Her fingertips were covered with blood and the end of her fingernails were gone. The calico cotton lining of the coffin was shredded and there were fingernail marks deeply carved in the wood underneath. Calico Coffin. The year was 1829. The sleepy town of Newcastle, Massachusetts was bearing the grunt of a particularly harsh winter snowstorm. Mary Brown had just turned sweet 16 and was sitting down for a humble supper with her family. Thanking the good Lord for sparing their house in this harsh weather and providing them with enough food, all were in a festive mood. Then the unexplainable happened. Before Mary even took her first bite, her entire body went into violent convulsions. She started choking. Her parents tried to save her, but to no avail, Mary was dead within minutes. Six weeks to the day after Mary's mysterious death, the Browns awoke early in the morning to loud knocks on their door. It was Mary's best friend, Sarah. In a panic, she told the couple that she'd just seen Mary floating down Main Street, her toes inches from the ground. Mary's ghost was smiling and laughing, said Sarah, as it aimlessly roamed about town. In the following days, many similar stories were heard around Newcastle. The 
Browns, who had rapidly aged from their grief and misery, soon became very ill, and both died just a single day apart. The Brown extended family, 21 of them, were a mainstay in Newcastle, simple farmers who've lived there since the inception of the town. Over the following year, they had all mysteriously started getting very ill, then one after the other. All of them, with the exception of Peter, a distant cousin, had died. Without exception, all the bodies had horrible teeth marks on their necks, though no blood was apparent. The townspeople knew that the spirit of Mary still roaming about was involved. Rumor had it that some members of the Brown family awoke in the middle of the night to see Mary standing over their beds, grinning down at them before throttling their necks in a death grip and sucking for blood. The people of Newcastle were at a loss. Jeremiah Buckner, the notorious witch hunter and vampire expert from Salem, the next town over, was summoned in a last ditch effort to end the horror. After meeting with the town elders, he set up a rendezvous for the following week, on the very day Mary had died one year earlier. The day had arrived. The clock struck midnight. Jeremiah, the elders, and Peter, now horribly ill, all gathered at the town cemetery gate. Peter could barely hold up his frail body. Everyone was expecting him to die within days, as the violent and horrifying pattern of the Browns indicated. The ritual they were about to perform that night was not for the faint of heart. As they arrived at Mary's grave, they started slowly digging until the coffin was unraveled. The elders were not prepared for what they would see next. Opening the coffin, they found Mary looking much like before she had died. Her flesh was pink and full of life, her hair and fingernails grown, and her lips were full and red. Jeremiah then poked her chest with his pocket knife. Mary bled. This was not by any stretch of the imagination an ordinary dead body. Jeremiah then proceeded to cut open her skin, reached in, and pulled out her bloody heart. Just at that moment, Peter gasped in relief. His body felt rejuvenated. It seemed his mysterious illness had all but disappeared in a matter of seconds. From that moment on, the sightings of Mary completely vanished. Peter, his health regained, would soon marry and have three children. The Brown family bloodline was once again revived. Though the town of Newcastle was now back to normal, to this day, its residents claim to see the ghosts of the dead Browns floating about with blank stares in their eyes.
Come down to the little garden with me. Come go with me. Come go and see. Though I howl across fields and my eyes turn gray, are you still the same? Are you still the same? Carry home. I have returned. Through so many highways and so many tears, you let it never survive the heat of my hand, my burning hand, my sweating hand. You love never survive the heat of my heart, my violent heart. So many highways and so many tears. Carry home to where I am from. Carry to the place that I have come. Carry to the dust that flies behind me. Carry to the cracks and caves on the face of me. Oh, but I didn't change. I changed how the world. Through so many highways and so many tears, yeah. 